Спасибо. Я хоть и говорю по-русски очень хорошо, а, потому что я русский. Ага. А, доклад будет по-английски, потому что, ну, так. Uh, so, from now on, I'm going to switch to English. Oh, yeah, I, I found a good reason why it's in English, because this person here uh, only understands English, so... Hmm? Inclusion. Yeah, okay. Um, so, Resilient Component Libraries with React is the title of my talk today. Um, and as uh, already mentioned, my name is Andre, and I... Yeah, apparently I do it for design and development of user interfaces for 20 years. And yeah, it's been a long time and yeah, I solve things. <laughs> and, but also I want to bring some of these things today during my talk because I think we, what, we, what the industry is generally doing is often is that they forget history and they forget where some things coming from and be kind of reinventing the the wheel all over again. <clears throat> it might be then a better wheel, but it's still, you know, it's still a wheel then. So yeah, this talk gonna be uh, about user interface design and development and kind of, it's gonna be more focused on development today because it's gonna be about component libraries. But nevertheless, uh, I think design uh, of user interface is one of those topics that is kind of underrepresented, especially in developer community. And I think that's also a reason why we have such mediocre products all over the web, inaccessible and with bad user experience because we don't pay a lot of attention to user interface design. And I think, uh, so the goal of my talk is gonna be kind of inspire you about, or to think more about the user interface design when you develop the applications and kind of give you an idea of how to create such like component libraries that would help you to create better user experiences then you develop your applications. And <clears throat> the idea of this talk came in, in, in mind, actually I just moved apartments, so we moved, uh, yeah, we, we lived eight years in one apartment and we were moving, and <laughs> I found this uh, wireframe that I drew like about 10 years ago when I first moved to Vienna at my first Viennese job. Uh, so I was doing some UI design and also development. Um, so I found this, all of these papers in my uh, yeah, in one of the boxes, <laughs> and it was um, interesting to see the, uh, all of his old wireframes because they kind of, oh, I forgot to start the timer, mm -hmm. so I know then to stop. <laughs> uh, so um, the, the interesting idea here was that I could iterate on, on my UI ideas super quickly, just this pen and paper, and then go and develop this uh, uh, as a prototype using JavaScript or whatever, I think the project was using Mutools back then. Who remembers what Mutools is? Two hands, three hands, four, five, six, yeah, more. Almost 10 hands. <laughs> yeah, cool library back then. Um, thanks to that library, we actually have a different, uh, really weird uh, function names, like pro um, prototype names. I think something array related was a big discussion uh, because the name was taken by Mutools. So Ec uh, ECMAScript had to use a different name, yeah. 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 Um, so, looking at that picture, I was uh, remembering how we are usually building user interfaces, or how we were building user interfaces back then. Uh, so, how to build a user interface, right? So, get a static mockup from a designer um, and write some HTML markup, markup that represents the mockup, make it semantic, whatever. Um, so, spend some time writing HTML mockup. <coughs> and then spend a lot of time styling it, like writing CSS, connect the HTML using class, uh, class attributes. Then sprinkle some JavaScript on top of it. Everyone remembers that, and they had jQuery, we would sprinkle JavaScript on top of everything, and then hand off to the backend developer, and the backend developer would replace HTML with PHP, Ruby, Java, even JavaScript again, using some uh, other syntax. And then they would iterate a couple of hundreds of times, and then they would deploy it to production, right? So the whole process was, uh, yeah, a long one, and it took a lot of time and a lot of effort of many people to create something meaningful. So far, fast forward 15 years, and React first appeared with this idea of components. 
and everything um, rendered in JavaScript or during runtime. Um, and this is how we were building user interfaces with React. So we would get a static mockup from a designer, and we would get the data from API endpoints. So here's the difference, right? So backend uh, developer now works on API endpoints. And they were rendered GS6, like they would render data using GS6 or that would produce HTML tags. Uh, and then we would still write some CSS and connect uh, with a different uh, attribute name uh, that's called class name in React. They would iterate multiple times and then we would deploy it. So the problem here is that although the, a lot of time passed and a lot of technology has changed, designers still drawing static mockups and developers still writing HTML and CSS. So what's the problem with static mockups? Uh, um, and don't get me wrong, these are beautiful. So if you go to Dribbble, <coughs> Dribbble is a, like an endless source of inspiration of these beautifully crafted images of user interface that you can use because these are images. And some of them are quite detailed, but even most detailed images I saw, these are still images. So you can just go and intera interact with them. So the static mockups, they never gonna cover all the possible states of your user interface uh, because it's really hard to do. And they probably never gonna cover all the resolutions because that's kind of an infinite number of resolutions. And during the handoff, they, they, the, lots of design knowledge are gonna be lost because of that static nature of uh, static mockups. So static mockups are static. But our applications are highly dynamic and they live in a highly dynamic media, right? So if you put it in a web browser, we can resize it, we can change the font size, we can change lots of things, and we can control the environment where it's rendered. So, um, and what's the problem with HTML, you might ask me? And the problem with HTML is that it was designed for documents initially, right? So it never was designed to build applications on a web. And what I mean by that is, like, if you try to uh, create text and headings of your user interface with HTML, it's quite all right, because it was designed to do that. Links also cool. With buttons, it's getting more interesting, right? Because there are two ways of creating a button in HTML. I don't know why. It's like that. Um, but then a product manager comes and says, hey, I want this fancy dropdown that I saw on Airbnb.com. Can you do that? And the developer will be like, oh, no. Now I have to copy paste a lot of HTML and then a lot of CSS and a lot of JavaScript to make it work. And every time you want to use this dropdown in our application, we would have to copy all this HTML at least, right? Because CSS, okay, it can be uh, class names, they are reusable, but HTML uh, structure is not. So yeah, just for dropdown, it's kind of a lot of code, right? for something that simple. So, um, and yeah, it's a lot of mental overhead. Then you try to read that, it's kind of, well, what's going on here? It's a, a button and drop them, was it uh, a list? Uh, and some aria has pop up. Um, and if someone forgets with aria attributes, the whole thing gonna be inaccessible, so it's gonna act not as drop down, but as a, as a div, meaning like nothing. So it's really hard to get right. Uh, so is there a better way? And fortunately for us, there is a better way, and it's called React, right? So React introduces thing called components, and everything in React is components, so we can start leveraging that, and I think most of you do, um, because that's the whole point, right? Um, so we, instead of using button directly in, in your HTML, we could introduce a button component with a capital B, and they could do the same for inputs. Yeah? So it's kind of um, starting to be right, or to feel right, because now we can do checkboxes and say checkbox is rendering input type checkbox, so instead of saying input type checkbox all the time, we can uh, do that. And these dropdowns is also getting easier, right? So instead of writing, copy-pasting a lot of HTML, we would just say dropdown button, menu item, menu item, menu item. And the whole cool thing about it is not only it's much easier to uh, write, it's also much easier to read, right? 
Um, the cool thing about components also is that they ch can change over time. So in the first iteration of a dropdown, we could still have uh, a normal select. But then when product manager comes and say, hey, I want this fancy <laughs> dropdown, we would just replace the implementation and without changing any line of uh, our, our application code, uh, hopefully. So that's a cool property of uh, component. But for me, the, probably the most beneficial property of components is that we can use components as a common language between designers, developers, project managers, and users. So um, yeah, then you talk to people, uh, you usually use this human language, right? So if someone wants to bu a button to be a button, they say, Hi, can you, can you make a button? Or can you make a primary button or a check checkbox, right? Uh, and in, if you use components, if you write components like that, uh, you can literally speak the same language using your code, which is, I think, really, really cool. So the, the first takeaway for today is uh, that components is a common UI language for all of the stakeholders working on a product. And I have a separate talk uh, going exactly into that direction uh, that I made last not this year at React Amsterdam, React Finland, so you can watch it on YouTube if you want, where I, it's kind of high-level talk, uh, mainly focused on that aspect. So if you're interested, uh, yeah, you can watch it. Um, so the next question was, like, uh, what's the problem with CSS? So we, keep still, we still keep writing CSS, right? So what's the problem with this? Besides the fact that CSS is hard, but many things it's, it's not, it's simple. So I have a short quiz for you today. Are you ready for a quiz? You're gonna, you're gonna have to raise your hand, so don't talk to me. I know no one wants, likes talking. So yeah, um, what text color text A and text B going to be? If you have these class names in your uh, CSS somewhere, like in global CSS, dot red makes color red and dot blue makes color blue. So and first paragraph has classes applied uh, in this order and the second paragraph has classes applied in that order. So who thinks that text A uh, and text A gonna be uh, what, blue and the text B, text A gonna be blue, text B gonna be red? Raise your hand. Okay. I can count around 20 hands. Something like this. Um, so who thinks that text A gonna be red and text B gonna be blue? Okay, one person, okay. And who thinks that both text gonna be blue? Okay, it's like 70%, I guess. So the fact is if you put even more people into the equation, uh, the the answer that can, comes as majority would answer is actually wrong, right? So 44% people uh, answered, like from how many, 15K, right? Think that first blue, second red. Uh, and that's because, I mean, it would be in, in an intuitive answer, right? So the, the whole thing with this cascade thing is, or the order of class names in your CSS and application of these classes to HTML uh, being like that is con counter intuitive. And I think that's kind of a big issue with CSS. But it's not the one issue uh, and it's not the main issue. I think in, yeah, that guy again. <laughs> um, so for me as a UI designer uh, and developer, I think the biggest issue with CSS that I saw in many, many products is that it's usually is the source of inconsistent user interfaces. And what I mean by that is, is could be illustrated by this nice picture made by Max Stoiber uh, somewhere in Austria, where every door has a little bit different borders and paddings and everything is kind of, looks like a door, but yeah, it, a little bit different one. Um, so by analyzing uh, different products, and where all of these uh, inconsistencies were coming from, uh, I saw a pattern that m most of this thing came from either color or typography or spacing and layout. Yeah? So, and that's because we usually write things like that, right? 
So we started like, we need to, to add a description, and so we add a class name called description, and then we write some CSS into it, with some rules, margin button, font size 16 pixel color, <laughs> and then we add a count uh, class, and we write some CSS to that as well. It may, may, may be even different developers doing that, so we don't even know who writes what. Um, and if you do this long enough, and I, I made a video of uh, huge application.css that I worked uh, on, I mean, from a product I had to work for, um, that takes like one minute just to scroll down, and I couldn't include it in this presentation because the video was like 600 megabytes and I couldn't optimize it small, to make it small enough, so the smallest version was 70 megabytes, and I can put it on web <laughs> just to save you. Like, because some people might be, you know, in data roaming and, yeah, they're going to hate me. So it's not included here. Um, but the result is kind of the same. So if you do long enough that process, you're going to end up somewhere here. So it's like these doors but these buttons, right? So these are all buttons, but they all look different, and they are all coming from the same product. Um, and there are lots of such examples on a web, and it's not only buttons, it's also like typography. So if you look... Uh, so this is like how many headers one of the websites had, and this is how many paragraph styles. So it's like dozens of them, just because. And the problem here, I think, is that CSS is just too expressive. So it's not the bad thing per se, but the power gives you, you know, that ability to break things. And yeah, if you have a, like, if you can break something, you ev eventually someone gonna break something, right? So um, the question is, what should we do about it? And I think for today, and before you start, you know, leaving the audience, yeah, think of it, think about it. Uh, I think we should stop writing CSS. Uh, but it, in in this comes in a context, right? So don't leave just right now. <laughs> so instead of writing this custom CSS, I think we should start using design tokens. Yeah? And I saw some talks today. Uh, uh, about Figma, and they also were mentioning design tokens. Uh, and only f they asked how many people know what design tokens are. So how many people know what design tokens are? Okay. <laughs> so yeah, some people know. Uh, so there are more people right now. So it's like ten people. And it was four before. <laughs> so this uh, six additional came from the audience, apparently. Um, so design tokens is kind of. Uh, are like things that can be reused across the whole uh, application, right? Um, think of them as um, variables, right? So, and the pro purpose of design tokens is to shrink the choice. So instead of having font size, whatever, like any, yeah, or font weight, all of this, we, um, we define uh, different types for fonts, font, font uh, styles, and we define our set of colors. So instead of having access to all of the colors, we only can use this. And this, we, we apply the same for the spacing. So we, we have this grid. So most designers, they already use grids. And they have this system kind of in mind. But now the, the idea here is that we also should be using this system in our applications. So basically, design tokens is, uh, are everything you use more than once in your styles. Um, I'm not going to talk too much right now about how we could implement design tokens, but more about how we should document design tokens. Because there are different approaches to that. I'm going to talk about just one, because I'm really, really short in time today. Um, and um, so yeah, the top line is a little bit cut, but it says expert default. So it's basically just an object. So uh, that's one of the ways of documenting design tokens in code. So what we could do, we could just define uh, an object that contains all of the definitions that we need. And for example, for colors, we're going to have this text background prime or second accent muted. We can add more as, as we go. We do the same for spacing, so that's kind of the same scale, almost the same scale. It's a little bit more uh, detailed so as before. Uh, so here we had this 8, 16, 24, uh, so it's, it looks similar, right? So it's 0, 4, 8, 16. Um, um, and from font sizes, we have a different scale because, yeah. So we document everything that is reusable, should be reusable in our application. 
Uh, and the cool thing about having this kind of object format or JSON format, whatever you choose, is that the heck we can generate uh, these beautiful style guides kind of automatically, right? So we can have this. Uh, yeah, and if you work with color, um, I, can't recommend, I can't recommend enough an app that I actually, <laughs> yeah, uh, involved in the development. So me and my friend, we developed this app uh, to pick colors from the screen. So if you have some time to do this job, uh, check it out. So we developed this app specifically for developers who work with designs. Um, so we could document gradients, we could document font sizes, um, like opacity, all of these values that we want to be reusable. Um, yeah, so that, that is an auto-generated style. So we have different, uh, oh, I think it's not, yeah. So I can scroll here. So you can see that typography, we have a different uh, typography spacing. It's the contrast rate is really low here. I mean, in, in, in my uh, thing, so it's not working well. So, um, but the next question, okay, we have documented these things, but the bigger question, how can we enforce usage of such design tokens, right? Because it's easy to create variables. We could use CSS custom variables, but the question is how to apply them consistently across the whole product, right? And uh, I think the answer to that is the primitive components. <laughs> um, and primitive components are like building blocks of a user interface. So think of primitive components as Legos, and then they can create different things out of the same Legos, so same set, different things. Uh, so I think this analogy works well here. And I want to start with basic primitives. And this next couple of slides also give, gonna have some maybe controversy. So bear with me. Um, so let's think about the React way. So because this is talk gonna be related to kind of how we build components with React. Uh, so the React way is kind of learn once, use everywhere, right? And the idea that powers React is we should go back to what we had like 20 years ago where we would just write button on click and it would take care of the everything, right? So it would still make it performant, it would still make it, because writing code like that apparently has a lot of advantages because it's, there's it no indirection. So if you compare it to some uh, even delegation system that made things performant, the, like maintaining this even delegated code was a nightmare. So if you ever worked on a big pro product that use this event delegation system or whatever, all of these optimizations, uh, it was a nightmare. <coughs> so the idea here is that, in, yeah, we'd, we would just basically write HTML as we would do uh, the stupid way in React, and React would make that smart. And the same idea applies to primitive components. So we had this font tag before, right? And I, I had to look up for uh, attributes they were called face, size, and color. And kind of the same idea is here. Why not take the idea from back like 20 years ago and apply it to modern uh, React architecture? So let's create a component that renders the text. So the idea is kind of the same. Learn once, use everywhere. And the, the next idea here is because we have so much knowledge about CSS, about all the CSS properties, they are great way of styling documents, the declarative way of saying how to lay out things and why not use them, right? So if you apply this knowledge to React way, we're gonna get a style system. And a style system is a product project made by Brent Jackson uh, <clears throat> that allows you to uh, quickly build custom UI components is constrained based style uh, based on the scales that you define in your theme. So basically, that is the thing that allows you to build components based on your design system. And it sounds a little bit meta, and that's exactly the purpose of this thing. So that is a meta programming thing. So it allows you to build, it gives you APIs to build your components. And I'm gonna show you how it works. So let's take a look at the text example, right? Because 80% of our user interface is the text uh, and consists of text. So then you think about, this text component, 
I usually start the process of creating a component with the question of uh, API design. So what should be develop what should what developers going to be doing with this component in order to uh, get it right to create a user interface out of it, right? And the first thing that comes in mind is, of course, typography, right? Developers should be able to change text style. So font size, font weight, letters, all of this CSS props goes in, in this bucket. And then we have an alignment, probably. Left, center, right. Don't use justify. So we can exclude. That's an interesting thing about this kind of API design, because we can exclude things we don't want to be in the API by deliberately excluding them. And justify is, you know, prob you probably know that also it's a problematic thing to uh, attribute to use. So, yeah, we can just forbid it. Uh, then we probably want to have different colors. And we want to control white space because if you think two paragraphs of text, if they, they need to some white space to breathe between them, so we want to add some margins between them somehow. Um, and the next thing is important as well because we kind of we don't know where the component is going to be used, so it could be a paragraph, but it also can be inline text or it can be a label. So basically, text is any text. So we need to control, give it some control to developer of where it's going to be used in the DOM. So the process goes like that, and it's like define a minimal set of props that can be customized and stop there, so don't, don't allow everything. And that's a difference to CSS. So if it's CSS, you would, or class names, it doesn't matter actually, because as soon as you give the control over the class name attribute, you're kind of also opening this Pandora box. So pretty much everything can be put into class name attribute, right? But here you basically, you, you're defining the API, and that is how it looks in code. It uses uh, emotion or style component, so it's interchangeable, and it actually also can be used, uh, I believe, this the static extracting uh, CSS. There are some steps needs to be done to that, but in the most basic example, this is how the text component could look like. So it's style.p, so it means it's gonna be a paragraph by default. And then we apply some defaults, so we remove margin, we set the line height for all the text we're gonna render, and then we create the API. And API is created by importing functions from style systems. In this case, it's color margin typography, basically what we discussed before. And then we add this function, uh, functions to the definition of component. And that gives us pretty much a component that has a set of functions, uh, a set of props defined into the, in, in this uh, functions, right? So it's going to be color, it's going to be font weight, font size, uh, let pretty much everything that type related to typography plus margin props. I'm going to show an example uh, in, a, in a second. But before we go even further, uh, remember what we're fighting this, right? So the, the, we're actually fighting this the too many different text styles. So that's not going to help much. Right? You still can create like thousands of textiles because the, if you think of the number of permutation of these props, there's probably going to be thousands or even tens of thousands. So we actually need something more. Uh, and that more uh, is actually less. <laughs> so less is more. So we, we want to define only necessary textiles. And we do this by looking at the whole product and we analyze uh, how many headings do we have to have, like on what level, right? So we only have to have one heading that size and one heading of uh, that size. And then the normal text, probably a secondary text, a little smaller, gray, and the error text, and, you, and so on and so on. So probably it's going to be dozens of them in, in the real world product. And um, UI inventory process helps with that. I'm also not going to be discussing that today because it's, a com it's not a completely different topic, but it's a separate process. Um, and the second thing about the API design is like, yeah, by, by defining all of these sets, we can create uh, things um, like, like we can create a prop, like we could say text primary, right? And it's gonna render this primary text or normal text, and the secondary text is rendered like that. But you see, th there is a problem if you go that route, and inevitably someone gonna try to do that. So it's like text primary, secondary, and yeah, what is it? Can you can can couldn't you decide? 
right? So we don't know what it's going to be. So what is a better way of doing that? So instead of using Boolean probes, you should be using variant probes. And you can use different names for them. I'm going to show in, in a minute. Probably I can't remember if I'm going to show it. But you, the variant can be a different name. It could be size. It could be importance, whatever you choose. But that's a much better approach because the impossible state is now impossible. So that's kind of a takeaway. You still can use Boolean props as well. Then it makes sense. Then it's unrelated to the variant, right? So disabled prop is unrelated to primary button, the look of a button. So yeah, variants make impossible states impossible. And we uh, had in this audience, we had a talk uh, before that, I guess, right? It's, uh, before that, about like the whole topic of impossible states, making impossible states impossible. And that is kind of achieved on a super lower level because the other talk was about the more managing state and uh, the whole application. And that is how to make impossible states uh, impossible on your application uh, component level. And it's also easy to add because the only function we need for that is variant. So we import variant from style system and then we list our variants like an object. And the good thing about that approach as well that we can, we can generate a style guide based on this object. So we can read this object, it's kind of, we can, we can put it into prop types, we can make types out of it, we can make a style guide out of it. Um, so it's, it's pretty much cool. Um, so yeah, the iteration on the text component would be like, like this. So the next one is gonna text where in secondary, gonna render secondary text. Um, the next thing is rigidity versus flexibility, because you could just go all the way variance, right? Make it super rigid, your system. But then it's probably going to be hard to, uh, to do things that you didn't account for in the first place. So inevitably, product manager or someone going to come to you and say, hey, but in that, in that, on that screen, we need a little bit different font style. And that's why I think you should be kind of providing both or even create a special prop that kind of signals that that is kind of one off thing, but you can still do that, but you shouldn't be doing that too often, so that kind of thing. And it's much easier to catch during code reviews. So make primitive flexible enough to not block you. That's also something I learned uh, the hard way because I was trying to do this rigid system set. You can, you can do things only like that. So that is the way it doesn't work. People are still going to find ways to do things they, their way, and it's going to be much worse as that approach, <laughs> believe me. Um, so the next one is HTML element. As I said, we don't know where the component is going to be used, so we need to provide a way to render inline text, right? You could do it like that. But imagine doing that for every HTML tag. Well, yeah, the same learning we had from variant, we should using we should be using a, a prop. And luckily for us, all of this CSS and JS library is already providing it. So this one also gonna be just S, or you can come up with your own like E's, whatever whatever you come from with. But just give away of rendering any HTML tag because primitives can be rendered anywhere. And that's a small example of these things working together. Together, So there is also headings here. But headings, I'm going to show later, is just a, uh, kind of a case of a text. Yeah. So we can change size here. So if I go here and I say L, nothing changes, right? Because it's, I think it, it's not working. OK. I'm not going to do live coding today. I, uh, so the next one is box. Um, and the same thinking can be applied to box. And if you think, what is box? Box is kind of everything. So we can control layout of a box. We should be able to control a white space. Yeah. We should be able to control colors, background color, color of, of text, border color, the border radius, shadows probably. So we can create this uh, like layered things or like things that look like they are elevated. Uh, and the same HTML element, we should be able to render everything. So the box is going to render div by default because it's just a container. But we should be able to render a semantic markup as well using that primitive. 
Um, and the implementation follows the same principle. So we just import functions from style system. We add them to the definition of a component, and that's pretty much it. And now you can create a box component that looks like a box, surprise. But the interesting thing here is all of these props here, they are coming from the like from a uh, design from a theme from a design system. So these are not values like random values. These are values that are design tokens, right? So and I we we, we didn't have to write any CSS code and actually just a couple of lines of JavaScript code. So I can change a gray value here to be five. And it's gonna be like that. Um, so yeah, the idea here is that we should model API of our primitives based on our CSS knowledge, because why, why wouldn't we? Uh, why should we reinvent the wheel again and again? And any front-end developer is kind of familiar with CSS properties, right? Must be. So then the next thing is that's also usually hard to do when you write CSS is responsive, right? So probably many of you struggle with how to do things responsive, especially if you have this cascade and class names and how to apply them right. And, and there are also different approaches in the community going uh, right, on, right now. Uh, one is like a special DSL syntax like this. So we could just create rows and calls and then we would have props for each of a resolution. And the, the problem here is that, first of all, what is role, right? What is call? Okay, it's probably a column, but what does it implement? What does it render in HTML? And what is what this prop stand for? Is it the length or height or the size? It's not clear from just reading that code. On the right hand side, they have the same component that we used before, but now we're just passing, instead of a single value, we pass an array of values. And each place in the array, like the first place is for the smallest screens, the second value in the array is for medium screens, and then the largest. So, and the idea of style system is that every prop is responsive. So it can, it accepts values or array of values. And I think that's the, one of the most powerful ideas of style system for me at least, because it makes uh, things like that, I'm gonna need to go, Super simple, right? So I, you see how it jumps from one uh, third to one half and then full width, right? And the color also changes because every prop is responsive. So even for variants that we created ourselves, we can use this principle. So you, you, normally it's a secondary variant, but if it's to, on a small screen, it's gonna be using error variant, which is rendering red text. You see? So I think that's one of the most powerful ideas of style system, that all props are responsive. And here it comes. So now that we have only two of these primitives, I mean, technically it's a little bit more. Uh, we, we're gonna have a heading here. Um, we can compose things. So we start putting things together and something uh, that would take us much more time probably uh, if we would write this in CSS, we can just mock it in, in, in React code in, in a matter of like seconds and play around with values and tune it really, really quickly, right? Um, so the next part is gonna be layout primitives. Um, so, um, these are like primitives that, so th that, that is all based on the idea of Nat Nat and Curtis. Um of that we uh, kind of also, like, we have the spacing scale, right? Um, but now we can compose space in a way that we manage a white space between components. Um, it might be sound a little bit counterintuitive right now, but I'm gonna try to show you how it works, and I hope it's gonna be much more clear. So primitives, the layout primitives are primitives to control layout and white space around their children. Uh, so let's take a look at Flexbox layer, right? So we often use Flexbox. So what we could do is like we create the same principle, we create a flex primitive and we apply all the, uh, all the props of the Flexbox to, as, as props to it. 
And now we can create a Flexbox layout just by using primitive, right? And again, all of these props are responsive, so we can change the, so if you go to the smaller screen, we can now change the layout of a subscribe form to be like the input on top of the uh, subscribe button on bottom, right? And the next one is a grid that implements a grid layout, CSS grid layout. Same principle, we kind of, we just provide components, there's the API that create the CSS for us. So, and the, the most interesting idea here is that I just put children, so I put four boxes inside this grid and they automatically lay out as I want. So I can go and change if it's gonna work. So by default it's just like that, so I'm gonna make three columns or two columns. So it's pretty much as easy as that. So you see I can iterate on my user interface super quickly. And probably one of my favorite components that I use most often is called stack, which is actually just a, an iteration on a, a grid component. And um, basically the same example I showed before, but there's a little bit more logic inside the how to render this out of fit thing. So, and the idea here is the same. So um, we just put some children into, the com uh, into this component and then we control the white space around them. So the components themselves, they don't control uh, the spacing. And that's also something that uh, I can't emphasize enough. Um, we can create a group component that, for example, if you have a list of tags, right, uh, you need to uh, have a spacing between them somehow. Uh, that is also not as trivial as you might think if you want to create a beautiful API to work for. So, uh, and the group component is, can be also uh, be um, composable enough to allow things like this. So if I add a separator that is a box that renders HR tag, I can go, oh, I changed it on the wrong screen, sorry. So if I uncomment that part, it's gonna render HR tag between tags. So I just went from like a list to a kind of a stack, right? because the, I, as a separate, I pass whatever I want. In this case, it's a box component. Um, and that's pretty much it. So the idea here is primitives should not have uh, any white space around them, so the basic one, and then you let the layout primitives to control the space around. Uh, so the next step is kind of going through, right? So you take primitive components and you compose another primitives out of them. So we can create a heading, right? So we saw heading before, but basically heading is a text variant heading as H1. And the label is a text variant label as label. And you define all of these variants inside your text component so you can control them from one place. And the error is a text color error because we don't have variant yet as paragraph, right? As simple as that. And then you put children into these things and they are rendered as you would expect. So that's basic principle of composition. That's why I love React because it encourages you to build your UI using composition, not like this inheritance thing. Um, <clears throat> and that's also the idea of primitives. They are meant to be composed, that they are extendable. So the next level is like going to the, uh, creating some patterns out of your primitives, right? And patterns is something uh, is that, um, yeah, I have a definition here, it's come from Wikipedia. So the pattern is, a, a design pattern is the reusable form of a solution to a design problem, but in this case, it's a UI pattern. So it's a, so we have a UI problem, for example, we have a card component, right, in the application, so it's, it's already application specific, so we want our cards in the whole app look similar, but we still want to have a control what's rendered inside the card. So, and here it comes, we take the same idea, but we make kind of a DSL that is app specific, we call it a card, and then we create components that's ca called card cover, card body, card footer, and then we put things into these things, and the cover, ca uh, card component itself knows how to lay them out. So you don't do any layout in, then you cr when you use a card, but it's still flexible enough to render whatever you want. And, or subscription form we saw before. 
So this is also kind of a live example. Uh, um, so I can go here and use tabs. So, um, and as you can see that um, the pattern is basically hides all of this kind of complexity from you. So inside it uses Flexbox component and text and input and button, um, but it's now hidden. And because um, that is a more complex example, uh, we have some additional props to render errors. We have some uh, things to indicate state, right? Uh, and yeah, as you might remember from the previous talk, you shouldn't be using such uh, props here, uh, so we should refactor that. Or the next state of a subscription for can be success. But yeah, same problem here, you can, you can see it probably already. I could write success, let's see, um, loading, and it's probably gonna explode. Or not, it's just gonna keep rendering success, so don't do that. Um, so for patterns, you see we can create card out of stack and the product card out of card. And if you go further, we can create whole pages from our product card now. And here's the demo um, of that in, sorry, what's going on? Yeah, that's what I was talking before. <laughs> went out of sync. So here is the demo. Um, so that's the website, Artyom, Sapegin, and me, uh, that we built during our workshop. So we do workshop about uh, how to build, about design systems with React and how to build component libraries with React. Uh, that's what we built with our participants during a workshop. Um, and here, the interesting detail is that there is an X-ray component that renders boxes. So if you press, if I press B, it shows all the boxes on the screen. So this all are primitives of type box. And you can see this is how many boxes we're using. And if I press F, it's gonna using it's gonna show flexbox. And the same for stack. And you see I yeah, I definitely like stack, especially for cards. When you have these three things and you want to control white space between between them, it's super useful for such cases. Flexbox is more like more complex layout where it's not so, uh, how I put, um, yeah, where you put things like on the other end and you want to control it explicitly where it should be. And boxes are just wrappers basically. Yeah? So these are all uh, displayed at the same time. And that's the, sorry, I need to press here to get out. Um, and that's the, the style guide that comes along is the, like, so then we're working during a workshop, we create, we're not only creating the application using like our design token, we're also generating the whole style guide. So the style guide is, uh, consists of uh, design tokens. So we have our design, design tokens here, but then we have all these primitives I, were, I was talking before, and uh, things made of primitives. This is still primitives because, yeah, what do you do with button, right? Uh, you can reuse it many, many times stuff like that. So we have icons here as well that you can see because uh, reasons. <laughs> we have images, uh, input, links. So we have a bunch of primitives and then we create UI patterns out of them. So we create this doc card that is specific to the doc. So the idea here is we, we just pass the doc information to the card and it knows how to render a card or a feature yeah, this this block here. So we, it's also kind of composable because sometimes we want an image, sometimes the, the icon, sometimes we don't. Or a hero component also displayed in all possible variations, right? In the inverted theme, these buttons and stuff like this, the navigation. And you can see all this, all these examples is how it's all uh, can be composed. So we, some of our primitives are more composable as others uh, uh, in subscription four I showed before. Let me get out. Uh, almost left like coding. And that style guide is made this React style guide list. Artyom uh, is the author and maintainer, and I'm co maintainer of this package, uh, of this thing you can install and use. It's like Storybook, but 
with a little di di different approach. So it uses Markdown to write your documentation. But it's, yeah, the idea is pretty much the same. Um, yeah, so we are close to the uh, end of, yeah, I'm completely desynced. That's why I look a little bit lost now. <laughs> so things got out of sync here. So to recap, um, components and primitive components especially are a common language, UI language, you can share across the whole team. And I think that, that that's just a better way of writing HTML and CSS. It doesn't mean you have to throw away all the knowledge of HTML and CSS. On, 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 a, contra on a contrary, you, the component allow, components allow you to embrace the knowledge and yeah, just make it more user-friendly or developer-friendly, if you may. Uh, if I may, um, then use design tokens to reduce choice and use primitive components that kind of give you access to your design tokens. And do not make any assumptions where your primitive is going to be used because that is a super important point I can't emphasize enough because then you start making assumptions that this kind of button is only going to be used in that container and the next thing is hap that's going to happen is like the new requirement going to come in and hey, uh, we need the same button here now, and yeah, lots of things can go wrong from that point. Uh, use layout primitives to control a white space. That's something also I think that is not as obvious uh, for uh, many people, and I think it's a super powerful idea to not control the white space inside your primitives, but having special things to them. And compose complex components using primitives. Because uh, then I was showing you the picture of the, the this wireframe I, I found, right, from 10 years ago. The thing I felt was kind of a dream for the future of UI development. Because I think what we have today is like we have this huge disconnect between designer, designer tools and developer tools. So we have a huge leap of productivity on developer end, but designers kind of, you know, left behind this all this pixel perfect mockups or vector perfect mockups, but they are kind of still not at the same level as there were some developments here. Um, because this, if you think about, like, if you would have primitives and patterns uh, shared between all of the parties, this is how we could build our user interfaces, right? We would just draw a wireframe with a designer, and then we just go and implement it, like get the data from an API endpoint, and then we just would assembly the whole thing quickly and we would iterate it together as a designer. Or, yeah, because the idea here is like, yeah, that should be enough for you, for everyone to understand that we need a heading here, we need a cart, we need a heading, we need a close button, we need a couple of uh, input fields, a button, a link, and two labels, right? It's obvious, so if you look at that, you should be in, you have all your design system, your component library, you should be able to create this in a matter of minutes. Uh, and to me, this is how the future of UI development should look, looks like, right? That's an experiment from Airbnb, uh, a video made by John Gold. Um, so they teach the artificial, like the neural network, they teach it, uh, the, they took their component library and they teach the, the neural, neural network long enough to understand what these things uh, on the screen, on the paper, should be translated into. And then it, you could just, you know, draw something quickly, put it into camera, and the whole user interface would be created for you. Uh, this production ready code, so you would just need to hook the data, basically. And I think that's super powerful. Uh, at least it feels to me, and feels like future. So I have a couple of links and credits here. Uh, you can check them online. Uh, that's the website that is dedicated to the whole process, to the whole idea of uh, component-driven development where I'm still planning to write content. <laughs> and all of this is gonna be a content uh, published somewhere, I think, on that website. Uh, it also offers these workshops and stuff, so uh, check it out, subscribe to the newsletter. And thank you and let components be with you. Okay, so take a seat. I have, we have 10 minutes to torture me? Oh, five minutes. Five minutes, cool. Yeah. And we can do it in Russian if you want. We can go in English. Yeah, okay. Let, let the people suffer. Yeah. <laughs> it's 
<laughs> you can do it in Russian. Uh, you can do it in Russian in discussion zone. Yeah, you can just reach out to me after the talk if you're interested. Yeah. I speak Russian. Don't be afraid of it. Uh, so, um, the main concern is that sounds really great, really effective, and really awesome when you are doing some brand new project. But reality is there are a lot of legacy projects where, well, you can't save the CSS at all. Uh, are there any hints you can tell how to migrate such, pro such projects? Because uh, this existing legacy global CSS will infect the CSS of your components, breaking the layout and doing all the kind of weird stuff. Just imagine you have a bootstrap next to your components. Yeah, it's tricky. I don't have any specific hints or tips. So w I've been doing such things uh, just by trying not to yeah, get rid of like global dependencies on, um, or actually just by adding like more uh, specific class names to that would override as globals and basically reset every, everything that comes from the com com uh, cascade inside a component. So like unset all or something like that. I can't remember the problem. Yeah, I always look up things on the internet. Don't be you know ashamed of that. So I, I can't remember how to do <laughs> it. Something like yeah, unset everything and then set what you want. Yeah, and that's been working well for a couple of projects for me. Um, but I think it depends on the size of the project. Yeah, so it's probably not going to work for everyone. Uh, okay, just another very quick question. The people are very curious uh, because I have like three different questions with the same wording. Like what you've used to highlight the components in the workshop demo. Uh, <clears throat> so it's uh, magic. <laughs> so we use M uh, I, I, I've been using MDX deck, and it uses a, a component that uses Prisma. Uh, Prism, Prisma, Prisma, made by Leo Vero, but it actually has different uh, highlighters. So you, uh, it also can be used uh, uh, can use highlight GS, I think, and then the uh, Artyom and me we created this custom theme. Uh, and the whole uh, presentation is also open source. Um, it's on GitHub. Uh, didn't give the link to the GitHub. Oh. OK. Mm. So it's like component driven on GitHub of our organization. Uh, I'm going to add it to the slides, and then I'm going to publish the slides. So uh, yeah, it's probably going to be on, uh, on Twitter uh, conference channel. So you can find the slides, and you can find uh, how the highlighting is done if you're interested. Yeah, and well, uh, the primitives and layout components are great abstractions for dev experience, uh, but they also make the generated layout way more complex than if you write it by hand, the output original. That might be a problem when you have like a large list that may aff affect the performance. What is the approach to solving that? First of all, I don't believe that is true. So I, I, I can't see how it's more complex than it's crafted by hand, because it's pretty much the same what I would do than I would write this grid uh, layout by hand. That's what's component doing for me. It's basically, it's not that much of a difference because it's, you, you keep using CSS props just by not using CSS, but they're using component API. So you're still going to learn grid layout. You still have to learn Flexbox layout. So these things are still required, so you, like, you're not getting any shortcuts here, sorry. Uh, and you can still be effective about how you lay out things using primitives as well. It maybe can affect like the DOM structure because sometimes... Yeah, exactly, DOM structure. Yeah, you, it, sometimes it's easier to put another box and wrap something, and the box can kind of produce some diff that is not required. And to that, I can say, I mean, um, it doesn't make any difference in terms of accessibility DOM, right? So diff is basically a non-existent thing. I also don't believe it's going to make a big of a difference for performance. If it does make a difference for performance, then you should be looking somewhere else, I guess. I think you have a bigger problem than that, this performance, if it, like a diff in between two elements makes like huge difference. So generally, my advice is like, don't care about such things too early, right? So make the architecture right 
and then care about performance because by having this abstraction in place, you can always you know go and rewrite or optimize and over optimize things and just uh, swap the implementation detail, go to static class extraction, class name extraction, whatever you think of, right? Because it's all in static analysis and stuff like all kind of solve problems, I would say, yeah, or technical problems. Okay, thank you. Let's continue this in discussion zone in any language you want, English, JavaScript, Russian, CSS. <laughs> so uh, thank you for your talk. Thanks for having me. Thanks for your attention.